I'm Tom Clements and delighted to welcome you to the Friends of the Key West Library's third online lecture of the 2021 season. My daughter-in-law, Lily King, will chat with Judy Bloom, herself a best-selling author and proprietor of Books and Books store at the studios of Key West. The Friends was organized nearly 50 years ago to provide financial and volunteer support for activities of the Key West Public Library. We raise money through memberships, book sales, and donations, with all money raised through membership going to support the library's annual needs for staff training, children's library services, Monroe County Historical Archives, and special purchases to support the library's mission. Please consider joining the Friends. Before we begin, I'd like to share some tips about this Zoom webinar. Unlike Zoom meetings, you won't be seen or heard during the session. However, at the bottom of your screens, you'll find both a chat and a Q&A button. The chat button allows you to share comments with your fellow attendees. The Q&A button allows you to suggest questions for our moderators to present to the panelists before the end of the session. In addition, there are links to both purchase Lily's books and to join or donate to the Friends. With that, I would like to turn the mic over to our friend Judy Bloom. Please join me in welcoming Judy and Lily for tonight's conversation. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, Tom. And thanks to the Friends of the Library for making this event possible. I'm very excited about it myself. <laughs> Lily, come down here with me. <laughs> come out. I'm here. So when we opened our bookstore in Key West um, five years ago, uh, your award-winning Euphoria was a big bestseller for us. It was on the staff rec list and people just gobbled it up. Now I, who've lived in Key West for a very long time and have socialized with your in-laws for a very long time, had no idea there was any connection. So when Tom just said that, I guess the news is out. <laughs> you, you have in-laws who live in Key West. I do. I, I'm certainly very lucky for that. Yes. Um, but tonight, I, you know, I want to focus on writers and lovers because this is, this is hard to say. When it came out in hardcover a year ago, I took the book home. And I sat down, uh, it was a Saturday, and I didn't expect to stay there in one place and read this entire book until I had finished it, but I couldn't stop reading it. And when I came to the end, I cried, not because the ending is sad, it isn't, don't be afraid to read it, it isn't, but I was bereft. Uh, I know I'm not the only one who has said this because I've read it in, in reviews and um, what others think of the book, but I just, I, I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to leave these characters. I didn't want to leave their world. And so I did something I've never done before. I picked up the book and I opened it and I started again from the first page. And I read it again. I don't mean to embarrass you, Lily, and I'm just going to say one more thing about that. And today, when I should have been thinking of wonderful, intelligent questions to ask you tonight, I read the book again. And I, I started it yesterday, and I read the whole book, and I finished it now. And it, it, you know, you can talk about, um, you can talk about what a book is about. You can. You can read what a book is about, but until you either listen or start reading it for yourself, you don't really understand what it is. And if, if I'm going to ask you in a little while to read something so that people will know, um, but it, it's, it's that thing we call voice, right? It's the voice. It's how is this told? It's what are all the details that we just love so much? So I want to ask you, Lily, what was the spark 
because for every book that we write, there's a spark. It's not necessarily the big idea, mm-hmm. but it's that spark that gets you started. Yeah. Well, first of all, I just want to thank you so much. It's all I can to do not to burst into tears right now myself <laughs> because because I I uh, uh, you know I've told you and um, and I've told many many people and I've said it in interviews and everything. You know the the spark I got in my in my life to become a writer was in my bedroom when I was eight years old um, reading It's Not the End of the World. Uh, I mean, you're, uh, I can't tell you, I mean, I just waited my, my whole, you know, childhood and adolescence. I just waited for the new Judy Bloom book. I, uh, my mother, I was so lucky that she bought me. Are you there? God, it's me, Margaret. Um, you know, went in hardcover and, and I, I just, um, I feel like everything I read up until then was kind of talking animals and sci-fi and fantasy. And I liked reading so much, but I didn't realize I didn't like what I was reading until until I read you. And this whole world of realistic fiction with real details and real dialogue and people with problems and families falling apart or not falling apart or, you know, I, I just, I felt like it spoke to me in a way that, you know, nothing ever had. And, and so when I read your stuff, I said to myself, I want to do that. And I'd never said that before. I'd always been like, oh, I want to read this. But then suddenly there was something that was like, I, 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 like I thought of you as a person who was doing this. And it was just very, very exciting for me. And once I had that idea, I never let it go, ever. There was nothing else I ever wanted to do. And, and it really is, I mean, people always ask me my influences. And I, I mean, honestly, I don't know if I would have gotten there without you. So I just, um, for you to have read my book and appreciated anything about it is, is, is like some sort of weird fantasy that I had when I was eight years old and it's now coming true. <laughs> and I, I also just have to say thank you so much to the Key West Library for this. This is so, so meaningful to me and particularly because my beloved um, father-in-law, you know, introduced me and he has been in my life for almost or over 25 years now, 26 years, and has really been, you know, kind of the closest thing I've ever had to a father, uh, apart from my stepfather who died years and years ago. And, um, and so Tom, I just want to thank you so much for that introduction. Okay, so now I'll just... Okay, now tell me about the spark. Yes, I I, I just will tell you, Lily, that at Christmas time, um, Tom always comes into the store looking for books that Lily might like to read. So, it's <laughs> sweet. So, so now, okay, now we have our love fest. Okay. We're done with our love fest, <laughs> and we're down to the spark that that so got you writing this. It's book. really interesting because you know um, it's kind of gotten billed as like a feel good novel and a funny novel, even though it it deals with very serious issues. You know, grief and poverty and you know holding on to a dream when it seems like you really should have let it go years ago and that sort of thing and 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 it is funny because the book did come out of a lot of grief on my part my mother um my mother died uh two years after euphoria came out and for that first year i was really traveling a lot for the book but the second year i was working and researching um working on another book that I got 20 pages in and gave up. And then I started researching another book and I was really, really into it. And I had about 20 pages. And then my mother died very, very suddenly, much like Casey's mother dies in the book. Um, although, you know, I was in my fifties, not or in my early thirties like Casey. And I could never go back to that book that I was working on that I was very excited about. It just, um, I just couldn't. It was part of my life when my mother was alive and now she wasn't. And I I didn't write anything for, I think, seven or eight or nine months. All I did was write in my journal. Um, And it was just, you know, I just had, I had no fiction in me. I had no discipline. And, um, and I didn't really care. I mean, I was so sad and so uh, out of it that I didn't, I didn't think to myself, oh, I'll never write fiction again. And that worries me. I just, it just didn't matter. And then one day 
I got an idea. And that idea was this character who became Casey, who I think was first named Mickey for some reason, I don't know why. And, uh, and I saw her walking a dog and I saw the yeah. landlord um, and I just saw that scene of her having just finished writing in, in the early morning and then being interrupted by this conversation that is sort of annoying. And, uh, and, 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 and I knew that her mother had died. And I knew when I, when I knew that, I knew that I had a place where I could put all these feelings that I had about my mom and, uh, and all these feelings about just what it is like to lose someone, you know, very suddenly someone, um, and, and, and I ratcheted it up, you know, in real life, I, I had a husband and children and a very, very full, very full support system. Um, but I often make my characters be in more extreme situations. And so she, she, her really, her one support was her mom and she lost her. And, uh, and, and, and it just, it, it provided a, a vessel for me to get, put those feelings in and also to explore a lot of feelings I had when I was starting out writing kind of late, you know, I, I didn't publish my first novel until I was 36. Um, oh, and, oh, late. <laughs> <laughs> it felt late at the time. <laughs> so that, that's where the, the first, first spark. And then once you get something that, you know, something that's going to turn into a novel, then it just starts attracting all these other ideas. And, you know, I was just writing things down. And for a, for a little while, I was just taking notes and, you know, waking up and daydreaming about it. And then, and then one time I just started writing it. I, I will just share with you one very personal thing that um, um, my father was the parent that your mother was, you know, the, the, the beloved parent. And he died suddenly um, when I was 21. And, you know, you, you, I mean, life goes on and you get over it, but you never really get over it. I mean, that was 1959 when I was 21. It was a very long time ago, but, you know, it's still always right there. So, so Lily, what, why don't you read us that little bit that we, we were talking about, and then we'll get into some of the detail that I want to get into. Okay, I'd love to. Thank you. Um, I'll just start with this. This is the first little scene. I'll just um, read a page and a half. Uh, it, it's funny because the part about the, the landlord and everything, I wrote right away. And this first paragraph, I wrote a little bit later. So I have a pact with myself not to think about money in the morning. I'm like a teenager trying not to think about sex, but I'm also trying not to think about sex or Luke or death, which means not thinking about my mother who died on vacation last winter. There's so many things I can't think about in order to write in the morning. Adam, my landlord, watches me walk his dog. He leans against his bends in a suit and sparkling shoes as I come back up the driveway. He's needy in the morning. Everyone is, I suppose. He enjoys his contrast to me and my sweats and untamed hair. When the dog and I are closer, he says, you're up early. I'm always up early. So are you, I say. Meeting with the judge at the courthouse at seven sharp. Admire me, admire me, admire judge and courthouse and seven sharp. Somebody's gotta do it, I say. I don't like myself around Adam. I don't think he wants me to. I let the dog yank me a few steps past him toward a squirrel squeezing through some slats at the side of his big house. So, he says, unwilling to let me get too far away, how's the novel? He says it like I made the word up myself. He's still leaning against his car and turning only his head in my direction as if he likes his pose too much to undo it. It's all right. The bees in my chest stir. A few creep down the inside of my arm. One conversation can destroy my whole morning. I've got to get back to it, short day, working a double. I pull the dog up Adam's back porch, unhook the leash and nudge him through the door and drop quickly back down the steps. How many pages you got now? A couple of hundred maybe. I don't stop moving. I'm halfway to my room at the side of his garage. You know, he says, pushing himself off his car, waiting for my full attention. I just find it extraordinary that you think you have something to say. I sit at my desk and stare at the sentences I wrote before walking the dog. I don't remember them. I don't remember putting them down. I'm so tired. I look at the green digits on the clock radio. 
less than three hours before I have to dress for my lunch shift. Adam went to college with my older brother, Caleb. In fact, I think Caleb was a little in love with him back then. And for this, he gives me a break in the rent. He shaves off a bit more for walking his dog in the morning. The room used to be a potting shed and still has a loam and rotting leaves smell. There's just enough space for a twin mattress, desk and chair, and hot plate and toaster oven in the bathroom. I set the kettle back on the burner for another cup of black tea. I don't write because I think I have something to say. I write because if I don't, everything feels even worse. That hooks it, right? <laughs> there it is, right there. I always tell kids, you know, they don't know when they don't know how to find a book that they might want. Mm. I say, open it up and read the very beginning and then turn to some page in the middle and read that and see what you think. Do you want to be with this person? Yeah. I wanted to be, I wanted to be with Casey. Oh, I wanted to be with her yeah. enough to read it. Through, <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell me a little something about the restaurant. Casey works as a server in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. And I was very fascinated because um, until the pandemic, my husband and I ate out a lot. Mm -hmm. And and reading about Casey, I know there have been a lot of books lately about restaurants and mm -hmm. servers and wine, but but not like this one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell me something about the restaurant and and how you came to that. Yeah, well, I I started waiting tables um, when I was a sophomore in college. And um, it, I paid my way, um, you know, through a lot of things through waiting tables until I was about probably 33 and I quit. <laughs> um, but I, I, I waited tables off and on for all those years from 18 to 33. Um, and I found that it was the best job that I could have while trying to write because I could, I was, I'm an early morning writer. And so, you know, my head would be clear and either I had to go to a lunch shift or a dinner shift. And uh, it, it was also kind of an athletic job where, where um, it, it didn't take the same kind of thing that writing takes up in your brain, you know, like teaching kind of drains you of the same thing. And I, I found teaching and writing very hard to do at the same time, but waiting tables was very easy in some ways. Um, and, and it was athletic and it was fun and it was social. And so anyway, um, I didn't know how to write about any other kind of thing that a writer should do, but wait tables. Uh, well, and, it's great. I love it. I was worried I about not being able to remember it. You know, I, I didn't, I, I, it had been a long time, but it kind of slowly came back to me. Um, and I have been thinking about, I, I rarely, I'm so curious if you think about your characters sort of beyond the novel. I mean, usually they're, my, they're contained in the novel and I don't think about them. But I, since the pandemic, I've been thinking a lot about Casey and people like Casey who lost their livelihood, you know, and, um, and that, uh, you know, I mean, depending where they lived, of course, in the country. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, and I know that there are so many writers out there who were waiting tables um, and, and have not been able to do it or haven't been able to do it as much. And, you know, it just... It, it worries me so much about, you know, people who are living on a shoestring and trying to have a creative career. And uh, I, I thought a lot about, about Casey and if there had been a pandemic, then she would have been even worse off than she already was. So <laughs> Would have been a very different story. I'm, I'm glad that Casey had her job. Um, so Casey, um, Casey is attracted to two very different men in the book. I mean, the, the book is, yes, it's about, I don't like to say what books are about because yeah. the book is about Casey, but yes, there is, there is grief and yet there's humor and, um, and there's, and there's becoming a writer and how tough that is for her and really for everybody, I think. Yeah. So, but these two very different men in her life, um, and the book is, I have to say it's sexy and romantic <laughs> in the best, in the best way. Um, but there's another love story in the book. And I think that that love story is 
one of these two guys has two little children, two little boys. And to me, and just when I read it again today, that just, that is so, oh, it so, comes from so deep inside. These two little boys really fall in love with Casey. They want her so much in their lives. And she falls in love with them too. And, and it's dangerous for her because yeah. she could make the wrong decision. But tell me about these two little boys. Do you have two little boys? Did you have two little no, boys? No, I have two I have two little girls who are not little anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, you know, I, I, it's funny, the love interests kind of, you know, shuffled around for a little while. I mean, Silas was kind of always Silas, but um, there were a few others that I was kind of um, playing with. And then these three, Oscar and his children came into the restaurant and I realized it was not just, just a an isolated scene and then we never see them again mm -hmm. as i was starting to write it i was like oh he's in here he's in the mix you know and uh and and then it was it was very it was just very fun to to write those boys and also i mean i had just lost my mom and they had just lost their mom yeah, yeah. and so i really i really related to them you, you know uh in a way that I, I wouldn't have otherwise. And um, uh, not only kind of was I an adult looking at them, but I was kind of, I was them. There's part of me that, you know, I, that I could really put directly into them. Uh, and, and, and I knew that, you know, it would, they would really, the Casey would connect with them in that way. And, and the, the scene where she takes care of them for a weekend when their dad has to go away for business, that scene just, it just, I love it. And it breaks my heart at the same yeah. time. And it's so wonderful. It's, it's just, that's a great part of the book, I think. I love it. So, so here's another um, offbeat question for you. <laughs> um, talk about golf. And how oh. golf got into this book? Oh, well, let me say the golf was sort of a, a failed exercise because I thought initially there was going to be a lot more golf. I was going to do all of this reading. I had a stack of books this big on, on golf and I was going to learn about golf. I just don't play golf ever. I mean, I've hit four oh. golf balls in my entire life. I uh, thought you were a prodigy, like Casey. Yeah. <laughs> Casey, just tell, tell, tell everyone who's listening, Casey in the book is yes, a former, it, a former. She was a child prodigy. She was, she was, her father was obsessed with golf, wanted to be a pro himself and, you know, came very close, but, but never was able to have that career. And she, she gets a, you know, a plastic set when she's three years old and makes one good shot. And the father is like, you know, the second coming has arrived and, and then trains her. And of course she's very good. And, you know, she's on the circuit and I can't tell you anything more because anything I learned about um, junior golf has gone completely out of my head, but I, I, I tried to research exactly how they go to tournaments and what happens. And, and I really thought, that she was going to end up playing golf with her father. I, I, there was going to be a tournament and there was going to be tension and there was going to be money involved. And I had this whole thing, but I could not do the golf research. I just, I found, I tried to read Tiger Woods' father's book about golf <laughs> and John Updike's essays about golf, which are beautiful, but I just couldn't, I couldn't ingest it. And so I was like, okay, we're going to get a couple of pages of golf and we're going to refer to it. And that's that, but yeah. But I believed it. Good. You see, I believed it. And I thought, well, Lily must have, you know, Lily must have played golf. She must have been a child prodigy. I have nothing but contempt for golf. And so that was easy. <laughs> that was, uh, 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 apologies to everybody who's a golf lover. Apologies. I just, just, just never grabbed me. So. But Casey also chose not to go that route. Yeah. Yeah. I was really interested in her having a parent who wanted her to become something else, you know, who wanted her to be something that she wasn't. And, and what happens, I know a lot of people who have had parents who really um, are, 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 are try to fix their course. And I was so lucky not to have parents who fixed my course. 
they had no investment in who I was to become. And, and in some ways, not great, but in some ways, really great. And, uh, and, and so I was interested in, in what it's like to reject that, you know, to, to have the writer in you be so strong that, that you would, you know, uh, reject everything that, that looks like promise and, and that everybody has rewarded you for all your whole life. Great, that's great. So um, I have uh, more questions about the book, but I think people would like maybe to hear about process. Oh, okay. And yes. then we'll come back to the book. Can we, can we both talk about process? Because I would love also to know about your process. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> I have heard you <laughs> talk with Susan Conley about process. And um, I'm chaotic and you are not. So yeah. tell me what that's like to write and not have it be just a mess. It is because... it's a funny thing. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> No, that's what I, I was just going to tell you that my draft, my first draft, I mean, this has changed over the years, you know, 50 years of writing is a long time to have written, but I want to hear about yours first, then I'll tell you, you first and me. Okay. Okay. Um, well, what's so funny about Susan Conley, um, who is a dear, dear friend of mine and just lives down the road, um, we always, we, we always laugh because she, in her house, for example, She's very, very neat. She's, she's very neat and, um, and tidy and clean and everything in its place and no dishes in the sink and all that kind of stuff. And uh, my house is a disaster. I mean, you know, not always, but you can often find dishes in the sink. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I, I'm just not, I'm not fastidious. I'm just not. Um, I can live and work around a lot of chaos. But what's so funny is that Susan is really messy in her process and I am just not. I, this is all, this is, I get an idea, I get a notebook and I start taking notes. And sometimes I put some notes on the computer um, and then usually pretty soon I just start writing. And so I have a little show and tell because I have my first notebook, Good. Good. Writers Lovers. I always write by hand. I always have ever since I took a creative writing class in high school. So this is the first page of Writers and Lovers. Um, I didn't get the title right away. I put that in later. Uh, I didn't know what it was going to be called. And so, you know, you can just see, like, I just start in. I liked being able to cross things off and put things there. And so I guess that maybe is messy. I, I sometimes draw in the margins. And I just, I take a lot of notes in the margins. Um, and I like, I like being able to cross out because, you know, on the computer you delete and then you're miserable because you don't know what you've deleted. Um, and so I just kind of start in and I always write chronologically. And usually this page of my first draft is the first page of the very last draft. I mean, I, it's not, um, it, it, I, I write very much, you know, from start to finish. Every now and then I, I put in something new in you know, a second or a third draft or something, but the structure is usually pretty much there. It's, it's, it's not a lot of pieces that I'm kind of inserting here and taking out here, you know, which I know Susan does. Um, and then, and so then in the back of the notebook, I keep, I keep my notes, just, a, just like 20 pages where I can just throw all the notes that I have because when I'm writing, I get ideas. And then, um, oh, and then, when the notes get too crazy, I, uh, forgive me if anybody's heard this before, because I, I do say this sometimes, I write a timeline. And so it's kind of pathetic and it's usually just for the beginning. And I, it's just little ideas that I have, you know, um, I hate looking at it afterwards. Like the first one is Adam slippers in driveway. So, you know, that's Casey in the slippers in the driveway and then restaurant crying crying intro to, oh, intro to characters there. And then the crocodillos, the this, this singing group. But that doesn't happen for later, but that's what I thought would happen. And then, you know, I have the father first visit with the ring, but I thought she was gonna go to his house. So, so I just have little, little ideas. They're not even chapters necessarily. They're just like tiny little moments. Um, and, then, and then the very last thing I keep in my notebook, apart from a lot of calendars, <laughs> I'm always like, I gotta finish this thing. Um, is a, like a writing log. And so I just write down when I write and how much I write. Um, wow. And I don't, I don't have any fixed ideas about 
you know, I have to write four pages or I can't get up. Just so because, are you, are you yeah. saying that you, you hand write the entire first draft? Yes. Yeah, it usually takes three notebooks. And uh, sometimes I start to type it in. At, at some point, I'll start to type it in and see what it looks like and that sort of thing. But most of the time, I just write and then, and then I have to have like three months of typing <laughs> because I'm not fast. And so it's just, you know, but that typing in is a really creative process for me too, yeah. you know, cause I'm playing around with everything. And so it's, it, 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 I really like that part because I have something, but I don't have everything. And that's, that's one of my very favorite parts of all of it. And then I just do that over and over. I print it out, take notes, print, you know, type more, fix it up, print it out. And then finally, you know, start showing it to my husband first and then to my writer's group and then to my agent and then to my editor. Okay, so what about your process? I'm no, well, well, it's really interesting because, um, well, when I started out, everything was different. We had typewriters. Yeah. So, you know, you didn't want to do, um, I mean, so I, I also have always written a lot by hand, but I've never tried to write a whole book by hand. But I do find that the brain hand pencil thing really makes a difference. And even, I mean, with the computer, I would print out tons of, of drafts and, you know, scribble all over them. My best ideas come with a pencil. But when the books that you read probably you know, that was before computers. And so we had a typewriter. And so it was, uh, it was three drafts and then send the third draft maybe to the editor. Wow. This is once I had an editor. And then there was the fourth draft of, after I talked to him, he always, whatever he said, whatever questions he asked me always helped me do my, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a rewriter, mm -hmm. not, not a first draft writer. I'm, I like to revise and revise and revise and revise until with the last book that I wrote, and that will be my last novel because I'm never doing it again. <laughs> that was five years and very intense. And I think I probably had 20 notebooks. I had a notebook just for research too. Uh -huh. But when, you know, it changed from a typewriter and five drafts, three drafts, send it to him, a fourth draft, um, you know, a, a revision, send it to him, a fifth draft, polish. And, and pretty much that was it. But once I got my hands on a computer, uh, that was like, that was the end of it all. And then it started with, uh, you know, draft after draft, the books became more complicated and they didn't just all come out spontaneously. Mm -hmm. And um, so I have become, if you saw my desk right now, I used to be like um, Susan, uh -huh. really neat, really neat everywhere except around my desk. And my editor always said, that's the place Judy lets go. You know, the papers would be all over the floor and things would just be a wreck. Now I've been um, with George, how long? Uh, 41 years. Oh George, is a, George is a lot messier than, <laughs> than, than I used to be. And I have learned from George mm. to be messy everywhere, mm. everywhere. Things are just every, I, I can't believe it. If my mother came in right now to see this, oh my goodness, she would. My parents were so neat that oh, my, um, my father had a tuxedo and um, he got a new one. I don't know how. They certainly didn't go out in tuxedos often, but maybe to weddings. And anyway, he was, got a new tuxedo and, and, um, my mother was to give away the old one, but it was so beautifully folded. She made a mistake and she thought that was the new one. And she, you know, hung it back up in the closet and gave away the other one. <laughs> so I come from neatness, but I am no longer, I am no longer, uh, I'm no longer a part of that. And, so and my process 
my process is what I tell the kids is the first draft. It's like a, it's like a puzzle, you know, to get the pieces yes. of the puzzle. And then the next draft is trying to put these pieces together and then you paint them. And right. anyway, it goes on and on like that. But yeah. Yeah. Um, so you, you are neater in your writing process and you know where things are and yeah. you, have it down. I've never thought of it as, as neat, but it just, it's all contained in one notebook, you know, and it's not spread. I mean, one time I went up to Susan's study, actually a room next to her study because she didn't have room to put these piles, like 30 piles of paper, little, little piles. And they were all different chapters and sections. And she didn't know where they were going to go in the book. I mean, that <laughs> that that is not the way I operate at all like I, I yeah I just I have much more of a of a chronological sense even if it's not exactly chronological within time but I know where I want things to go I mean every now and then you know that that gets changed but but not so much and it's so funny because I came from very 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 neat people too um, so I don't I think I rebelled against the neatness but what's so funny is that I remember when I was when I was Casey's age, I was living in the attic of my sister's house and uh, she's much older than me. And uh, I was a slob and um, my mother came to visit and she came up to my attic room and there were clothes everywhere. Just, you couldn't see the floor. There was just clothes and books and notebooks. And she looked at me and she was like, Lily, how are you ever gonna find a husband if you have a room like this? <laughs> <laughs> Well, Lily, talk a little bit about the fact, um, you know, you and I spoke a little bit about this uh, a few days ago about the woman, the woman who wants the creative life, the young woman who wants the creative life when all of her friends are marrying and sending her wedding invitations and baby announcements. And she, uh, tell me some. Tell me something about that because you wanted to write that in this book. Yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I, I was, I was just interested in that time, um, you know. In, in a, it, I think just I do. I think it happens to a lot of creative people, people who are are choosing, um, you know, a different road that uh, does not have the same markers along the way. Um, and, and they watch all these people in their life um, kind of, you know, start doing the normal things, you know, getting a job, getting a salary, um, getting their own apartment. I could never ever afford my own apartment for years and years. And uh, uh, um, then you know finding like being successful in a relationship and getting married and then talking about children and all that kind of stuff and so i i think um often not not always by any means but um when you when you don't have money and you have a a big dream you don't want to give up on it, it's it's hard to do all of those things it's hard to to stay on that sort of a, a track, you know, something has to let go. And, and so I, I did, I really wanted to, um, to write about how that's not easy. I mean, it might, it, I don't know, it, it might look easy and it might look like um, you're copping out or you're being lazy or you're, um, I don't know, you think you're special, like all these things. Um, and yet, I, you know, when you're doing it, 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 it feels really scary and really hard and you often feel alone. And so I just kind of wanted to write about that. That's true, isn't it? The loneliness of writing. Yeah. It you is have very... to find people who are doing the same thing because they make you feel seen. Yeah, I didn't have that, you know, when I, 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 and mine, I mean, I was a creative kid, you know, I grew up in the 50s, so, and I, I, I was a creative kid. I didn't even know that I could find any kind of creative work. I, I, you know, went to school and got a degree in education so I could teach if, my mother used to say, if God forbid you ever have to work, you will be able to get a job. 
I used to tease her about that. Um, um, but so I, I did get married. I married when I was 21. I had two kids, 23 and 25. I had my kids and I was desperate, desperate to find that creative. I needed that creative life. I needed something in my life. And, and you knew that. You just knew that. Yeah, I think I was, I was, I was very unhappy, I think, yeah. not with the kids, but, you know, yeah. I, I, I knew that something was missing. There was something hollow inside that was missing. Mm -hmm. And it could have been anything. It could have been anything to, um, to fill that hole inside me. But, you know, I was home with little kids and um, I'd always loved to read. Mm -hmm. And, and that was how I started to write. And of course, that totally changed my life oh. I mean it gave me my life exactly. and, it, and it changed my life but I didn't know anyone who wrote or had written I knew no one I had no really? community no and it was so so lonely so lonely can you, can you tell me that the moment when you started writing you know at that time was it was it are you there god it's me margaret or did you write something else first or and so how did was, you even yeah. think to do that you know did you read a book and think i can do that too you know um i read a lot of books yeah and when i when i decided that i wanted to try to do this i would go to the library little kids you know i'd take them with me to the library and i'd just come home with armloads of books and and there i had my influence my Harriet the Spy and um, a couple of other books. And I knew that I wanted to write books like those books. Mm. Um, I, that was what I knew. And I wrote a couple of books before Margaret. I mean, Margaret was the first one where I let go. And so how spontaneous um, did Writers and Lovers, was it, was it spontaneous or did it just come once it started? I think it did. It's so hard to look back and, and of course, all I remember is the time that I wanted to completely give it up where I really didn't think that I was gonna to get to the end, you know, and, and going down to the kitchen, like I always do <laughs> and telling my husband, I, I'm, this, is not, this is not working, I'm gonna to have to give it up. And he's, he's like, you, you know, you you always always say that and I said no no this time this time I really mean and he's like you always say that too <laughs> so I, I know exactly what you're saying um because I have said many times I'm never doing this again not in the beginning not for all those oh. years uh. that um you know it was so exciting and wonderful oh. um but later on I'm never doing this again too hard. I just can't. It's, and George would humor me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. And right. you, did, you did just tell me that you're not going to write a novel again, but I don't. I'm not. No, Lily, really? this is, this is true. I went once, once we opened the bookstore and I had um, something wonderful to do. I, I was, you know, by then 78 years old, I'm 83 now. Mm -hmm. And um, I had, and I had finished uh, I had finished in the unlikely event, which is, which was five years, very intense. The book that I feel I was born to write, and I finished it. And I said, I'm never doing this again. And then how lucky that it was just kind of then when I finished the book tours and everything that we had the opportunity to open a bookstore. So. I have a place to put all that creative energy. Yeah. I yeah. get up and I go to work every day, although it's been a year, thanks to the pandemic. But now that I've got my two shots, I can go back to work in a few weeks. Um, but it is, it's, I find it very satisfying, very creative. And um, I just think how lucky for me. But yeah. you, great. you must continue to write. <laughs> and I know we're gonna stop very soon for Q and A. I just okay. want to ask you, I want to ask you two little things that you asked Susan Conley. Oh yeah, please. Because I was right there thinking about it. Um, 
what do you hate most about writing? Well, it's really that, that time, two thirds of the way through any novel, I, I just want to, you know, pull the parachute or, you know, I don't know. I, I just, I want out. I want, I want to stop. I don't have any confidence. The doubt just becomes so huge and it's always two thirds of the way through. Um, and, do you know uh, any, do you know any writer um, who isn't anxious about his or her own work, who doesn't, who's, who's secure? I don't know anybody. No, I don't know any either. And no matter how successful, no matter how many books, that yeah. insecurity is always there. This is terrible. This yeah. is awful. And yeah, um, I think it, there's an inverse relationship. The more books people sell, the more doubt they have about themselves. <laughs> right. They're going to find out that I don't have a clue what I'm doing. And then it's going to be all over. Exactly. And, and what do you love most about writing? Oh, um, I think I just... I love those mornings when I eat my breakfast and I make my tea and I come to this room um, and I have my pencil and I have my notebook and I have the, you know, most of the day ahead of me to play. I just love that. I love that. And I love the feeling afterwards, after I've actually gotten something on the page. That's a oh. really great feeling. Right. Yeah. And the, what about you? And the, the surprise. I like best the, of course, a good day when I'm writing, but the surprise of, oh my God, how did I think of that? Where did that come from? Yeah, the yeah. surprise of it. Um, yeah, that's but, so but I hate everything about it that you hate. <laughs> it's so hard. It's so hard and lonely. But you've done such a wonderful job. Should, should we open this to Q&A? Is anybody there? Sure. Hello, Emily, are you there? This is Emily Berg, who's on the board of the Friends of the Library and also happens to be the exceptional and wonderful general manager of Books and Books, our bookstore. And I get to see Emily almost every day. And it's always a pleasure. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to see you. And it was great watching you guys talk. Um, Willie, I love the book as well. Thanks. We sell a ton of it at the store. So it was really, it's been really fun listening to you guys. Um, we have oh, a... Yeah. I'm sorry, Emily, I was going to say, save us a minute so um, Lily can tell us, or maybe she wants to tell us now, what's up next, Lily? Yeah. Well, I have a, uh, I just finished the edits on a collection of short stories. Um, so that comes out in November. It's called Five Tuesdays in Winter. Uh, and then I have an idea for a novel. I've taken some notes. I have a notebook. Oh, going. You have the notebook. Go I ahead. do. I do. And uh, it's very different, but, you know. Every book is very different. So this one is very different. <laughs> and everybody out there who hasn't yet read Writers and Lovers, you are in for an incredible, incredible experience <laughs> and treat. Thank you, Judy, so much. Thank okay, you. we'll turn this over to Emily for Q&A. Well, and I'm going to turn it right back to you guys because we do have a lot of great questions. Um, one, well, this is kind of a comment, but Lily, you're talking about you know, thinking of your characters beyond Sharice Tasker says, I want to know how Casey is doing. And that's, I felt the same way. Like, I really want to know what she's up to. And even though the book felt like it ended kind of all wrapped up, we mm -hmm. know it doesn't because that's life. Exactly. <laughs> it's going to happen. So I don't know. Would you ever, do you ever have any interest in going back to you other know no, I don't have any interest in, in going back myself and writing a sequel or anything. And usually I don't know. Usually my answer is I have no idea. I don't, I don't follow the, the character by the end, you know, after the last page. But in fact, I do know about Casey because, you know, I, I feel that, uh, you know, we, our lives are quite similar in a lot of ways. And I do know that she married Silas and- uh, oh. Oh. Oh, oh what sorry, a erase your memory. Erase, 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 Listen, erase, you erase. You didn't hear erase. that. You didn't hear that. Sorry, so sorry, so sorry. I know. You need to know throughout the whole book, you don't know how anybody's getting to wherever they're going to be and all the, and her relationship with these men is, like Judy said, is such a small part of yeah. her life. So it really is not a spoiler at all for the book. <laughs> I do. I mean, I, I, I like to think of, you know, her as, um, 
doing very well right now. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, and then kind of in a similar vein, so we have uh, Lee Solomon said, how, uh, how are you able to write in a way that makes people, well, actually it's a statement, how the way you're able to make people write of all ages seen is stunning. And I sort of had a similar thought going through when I was thinking about questions is um, it, the book appeals to a lot of people. I mean, it appeals to servers, which we covered a little mm -hmm. bit and um, writers, successful writers, maybe writers that aren't being, aren't so successful yet. Um, for example, for me, the whole scene with uh, her friend inviting her to her wedding was like so on point and scary to me and like <laughs> infuriating. Um, and even hearing you read the scene with Adam made me like fume a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like I was getting angry for Casey. Um, was that a conscious effort on your part to try to not necessarily hit all these points, but definitely appeal to a wide audience that might be within this one character? Oh, it's interesting. You know, I have to say, when I'm writing a novel, I just cannot think about the audience. Um, I, I just have to think about what the, what the story is and how I can best tell it. And I try, I mean, of course I'm aware of readers, but the first reader is really me. I'm just trying to write something that I would like to read. And, and, and then, and if I thought about kind of who out there would read it and who would be interested and who would not be interested. Um, I, I, I think it would, um, it, it would stifle me in a lot of ways. I, I think I'd get too self-conscious and not be able to go on. Um, and I, you know, I can't think about, you know, what my relatives will say, what, you know, anything like that. My cross the street neighbor who I'm, who I adore. Um, I don't know, you know, I just, I, I have to, I just have to kind of stay true to the vision I have at first. And then we're hope, writing it, hope yeah. that other people will be interested. We're writing it for ourselves. Yeah. And, you know, we can't, I think, ever think about who's going to read this. Um, yeah. You know, that, that just takes you right out of it. So yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't think does. that. And at the same time, having readers is just the most fantastic feeling, <laughs> you know? It, it, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it just, it, it's just, you just feel understood and connected and it's just, that's great. And it's what I'm going for, but I can't think about it. <laughs> um, so we've talked about the process a little bit, both of you did, and this question is for both of you from Susan is um, on, a, on that same note, how do you know when you're done revising? How do you know when you do give it to somebody to read, such as your editor or your partner, whoever it might be who's getting that first draft? Do you wanna go first? Do no, you, you. you do it. <laughs> um, it's really when I can't do anything else, when I can't see anything else and I just have no more ideas for myself, then, then, I, then I need help from other people. I need to know um, what I have been blind to and, you know, what I need to explain more, what doesn't need to be there, all that kind of stuff. So helpful. And I have this really great writers group that Susan is in um, to help me do that. That's, yeah, it's a, I'm, I feel exactly the same. And I mean, there's always a danger that if you, if you don't send it in, that you will destroy it. You'll do too much. And there's some sense that we have right of when it's time to let it go yeah and um, yeah no it's yeah. true um so this is a question that's might be a little obscure especially if you haven't read the book quite yet I don't think we've talked about it but I I had this question too Lily can you talk about the geese a little bit and their importance in the book yeah it's funny I, people ask about that a lot and I that is something that I didn't start out with it being this big symbol, you know, for the book. Um, it just kind of grew. It just, every time they came in, they, they, they grew in importance and they, you know, the first time I, I had them, um, uh, I, I had them because I know that strip of um, Memorial Drive in Cambridge and there are a lot of geese there and, uh, and so I put them in, but then she starts thinking about her mother. And then the next time, you know, 
she again has an experience with her mother. Um, and, and in my own life with my mother's death, birds were very important. You know, I, I know a lot of people have had these experiences when they lose someone very close to them. They feel there is some message from the natural world, you know, that seems more than a coincidence. And I, um, that was happening me, with me with birds. And so the geese, you know, it felt like a, a natural thing to, to have that be true. And, and yet it happened really organically. And then, and then my, my daughter Kala drew those geese um, for the, the inside of the, the end pages. Oh. Um, that was really, really sweet. They're so cute and beautiful. I have them right here. <laughs> And we should mention uh, Writers and Lovers does come out in paperback tomorrow. So we're getting like the first. All right. Episode. Sorry, yeah. I'm trying to show you the yeah, geese. Beautiful. There they are. There they are. <laughs> Lovely. Um, this is, we've got a couple of questions here um, for Lily and I guess for you too, Judy, although I, I think I know the answer to this for Judy. But um, Lily, can you, can you talk? <laughs> about your writers group and um, how long you have been in it? Are you still, you know, I guess we think a lot about people joining writers groups when they're kind of getting started, mm -hmm. but as being an established. And I guess I don't know, Judy, if you've ever been in a writers group. I didn't, I feel like I know everything about you at this point. So no, I because I didn't know anybody. I, I didn't I know anybody. I would have, you know, been so happy to have had a writer's group, although I do think you have to be careful, right, Lily? I mean, you know, you have to be careful that you're in a safe place. Yes. Um, just like if you take a, a, a writing course, you don't want to be with a teacher who um, doesn't make you feel safe or who is yeah. mean. Yeah. Um, I always say to people, get out of that. If you find yourself in that situation, get out of it. Yeah. But you clearly have a writer's group that you can trust oh yeah and, and that's that's wonderful yeah yeah we i think we've um i want to say maybe 2004 we started it um when I, I i live in maine and uh we moved here in 2002 so maybe even 2003 we, we started it and um it just uh it is it's a very very safe place um it's so, honestly, my writer's group is so much harder on my books than the New York Times, the Washington Post, Turkish. I like, Honestly, if, if I know that if I, you know, if I fix everything they say, I'm going to be okay because they are hard. They are hard to please. And I really need that. And I love it. And, and, and what I love about criticism is that, you know, you don't, you don't take everything. You, you just, you, you know what, what makes sense to you and you leave the rest and uh and they always help me make it a better book and it's just it's fun to see what people are you know we all like we can go years without anybody having a book and then suddenly there'll be three books that we read <laughs> and uh and it, it just it's just so great to um to have people who who really identify and recognize what you're doing and you know the life you've chosen and, uh, and, and who are just really, really, really good readers of your work. That's great. Yeah. I think, Emily, that I just got a little message that that had to be the last question. Did you get yeah. that little message? I didn't, but I, I, I felt it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I feel that we are kind of coming to the end. There's still a lot of other great questions. And I think uh, if we can forward them on or, or get answers to people, we'll do our best to do that. Um, but uh, in, I think that's where we have to end for this evening. And um, before I throw it back to Tom, I just want to say thank you to Judy and Lily. And um, we'll uh, turn it back over to Tom to tell us where we go from and, here. And thank you to the library. And Lily, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed this and I'm not nervous anymore. I could talk <laughs> to you for hours now. Um, so thank you. And thank you, Emily and Tom. Oh, okay. thank you. Thank you all so much. This is 
been one of the huge highlights of my life, honestly. <laughs> so thank and you. Please, if you're out there, read this book. Don't miss this book. It's just, it's a wonderful, wonderful moment for you to read this book. I hope our audience has enjoyed it as much as I have. Lily and Judy, this has been, what a treat it's been. And on behalf of the friends of the Key West Library, I want to thank you for uh, having such an enlightened and entertaining uh, presentation. Uh, I also want to thank all the attendees who joined us. You're the reason we've put this together, put together this whole uh, lecture series, and without you, it wouldn't exist. Finally, let me thank all the people behind the scenes who made this possible. Without their help, none of us would have been here. And do look in your mail tomorrow for a link to the recording that's been made of this talk and feel free to share it with your friends or to look at it again yourself. We want to thank those of you who donated to the friends and supported this lecture series. And for those of you who would like to donate now, it's never too late. We're most appreciative. The website has full details. If you want your own copy of Writers and Lovers, it's available on the Books and Books website. Now, turning to the next speaker, Tom Corcoran, author of, Key, of a Key West-based mysteries and numerous nonfiction books, including three on the classic Ford Mustang car, uh, who has also shot photographs for seven of Jimmy Buffett's album covers, will be our speaker, a man of many talents. With that, we close out this week's lecture Hope to see you in two weeks' time on Monday, the 1st of March at 6 p.m. And many thanks for coming. Bye-bye.